Okay, it's noon, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Katherine Thomas, and I am the Customer Success Manager here at GroupLink. Um, and today, on the agenda, we're going to go over the LDAP setup, configuration, and troubleshooting. Uh, this was requested in last month's webinar, so Dan is going to go ahead and do that for us today. Then we will go over using the scheduler, um, how you can automate ticket changes and automate emails. And then go to the service level agreement and the asset configuration. Uh, just keep in mind that everything that we go over today, we do have a written instruction step by step uh, that we will go ahead and email out to you. Uh, so you can just watch us do it here, and then we will send you the materials so that you can go ahead and in your help desk. So I am going to turn the time over to Dan. Can you hear us, Dan? I can, yes. Um, sorry, I was on mute there. Can oh, you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Let me share my screen here. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. I thought I lost you there for a minute. So I'm just going to go over these fields here. Fairly straightforward. We authenticate Active Directory or eDirectory. Of course, the majority of companies, businesses now use Active Directory. So the first field here, the LDAP URL is basically just the, is just the server of your Active Directory. Um, so for instance, I, now I'm going to put in ours, but ours is currently down, but I'll just go through the, through the steps. Um, once you do this, you can hit fetch DNs. Again, ours is not going to work. Um, what, th what that'll do is it'll pull up your um, base search DNs here. And generally, that would be something like um, DC equals group link, comma, no spaces and all this, DC equals um, net. So that's where the search will begin. And then from there, you just need to put in a LDAP login user that has access basically to your LDAP or the uh, DNs that you want your you the DNs that you want your users to be imported. So here, this this base search DN would start from our very top of the tree basically, and then scroll the whole the whole LDAP directory. Um, so I, I would put in. You know, I put in my login. Um, the, the login is actually the full domain. I, I'm not exactly sure what they call it, but qualified domain name, something like that. So it would be where the user resides. So basically, I um, in my tree, it would go something like this. Um, OU equals support. OU support, comma, OU equals GL, and then, of course, the beginning of the tree, DC equals. So it starts from the container all the way up to the um, top of the tree. So that's you do need that as a login user. And then, of course, just the, the password for, for that user that you use. The username attribute field. So within AD, now I'm not no expert in AD, but within AD, there's attributes for username. And, and that can change. Like, for instance, we are using in ours Dan Cabrera as my – as that would be, uh, like, my login name. Um, others are, like, for instance, D-A-C-A-B-R, just, you know, the first name. However you have your LDAP set up, the username attribute set up, you can set it here. So as you can see, the what you would put in here would be the UID or the SAM account name. So that determines, you know, which, which user ID to pull in and to log in to the help desk. I hope that makes sense. This search filter I've never used, actually, so I'm not even quite sure what it's about. Um, but if you click on these little explanation points, it'll, it'll explain, you know, the details of, of each field. The EHD fallback. So, for instance, if your LDAP goes down, any users that are currently imported will be able to still sign in because it gets imported into the database. So, 
if you're having any issues with active your L, your LDAP, if they're already imported, they'll they'll still be able to uh, log into the help desk. Uh, the location attribute um, again, it's just an attribute within LDAP um, of your location. You know, if you're in HR, maintenance, whatever, the, you can set that in here. Again, that's uh, most people don't use that, but that's that is an option, and that's what this is here. Uh, create location. So, for instance, if there's no location in here, if it's not in this section here in the locations, the help desk will go ahead and create the new the new location for you. This inclusive search DNs. What this does is um, it's going to search. We set here to search at the very beginning of the tree. If you want to exclude, you know, if you don't want all users to be able to sign into the help desk, you can um, enter in um, certain, you can enter in containers that you do, that you want to sign into the help desk. Some of the troubleshooting issues, basically, um, if I were to put in my LDAP URL and I click on fetch the ends, I'll, uh, I may get an error stating, um, unable to parse DNs. Basically, the help desk is not able to reach your LDAP. I don't, it could be firewall. Uh, maybe it's, you know, I, I don't know. Usually it's a firewall issue. Could be a port issue. LDAP URLs can be set as um, security. So could, you could have LDAP S. If it's LDAP S, um, it could be possibly ports are being blocked with LDAP S and regular LDAP. There's different ports, so you, you need to make sure that uh, those ports are, you know, are not being blocked. Uh, I think the standard port uh, for LDAP is 389, uh, secure port is 636, so um, that could be part of the issue. Another, another issue I see a lot is um, the login ID. Generally, people just put in, you know, their, uh, just the, you know, Dan Cabrera or D Cabrera or whatever, but the login ID does need to be the fully domain name in order for that to work. And that's pretty much it about uh, with the LDAP setup. Okay. Um, just keep in mind, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in the Q&A, and we can answer those at, at the end of the webinar. Um, our LDAP was not set up. We had set this webinar up, and then we are in the process of moving to our new office. So um, some of the servers are down right now, so I apologize for that. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. Or Dan, will you unshare yours? Um, yep. Okay, so I'm going to go into the scheduler here. Now what you'll do is you'll log in as the admin. Um, if you've given yourself admin rights, then you'll be able to do this as well. So it would be under the settings button here on the, the right-hand side. Um, it automatically comes up to this if you're logged in as the admin, but if you are logged in as yourself, you will need to click that. And then you would click on the scheduler on the left-hand side. Now, if you notice, this comes up with all of the groups that I have set up um, in my help desk. And so you would just need to click onto the appropriate group where you want to set up the scheduled item. And then click Add Schedule. Now, in the handout that I have for you, I've given you um, three different examples as to why somebody would set up a scheduled item. Uh, and what this basically does is you can have the scheduler run to change items on the tickets. Um, you can have the scheduler run just to send out an email. Uh, I get a lot of customers that just want to send out an initial email when a ticket comes in. Um, just letting the person know we did get your ticket, um, if you, you know, what to do if they have questions, or just whatever message you wanted, want to send to your users when a ticket has been submitted. So the first one that I'm going to demonstrate here is um, having the scheduler run to close tickets uh, or setting them to resolved or having your technicians set them to resolved and in X amount of days, if nothing happens on the ticket and that modified date doesn't change, it'll just automatically take them to closed. Uh, the reason that we do this is uh, some customers like to just keep them at resolved just to make sure that it's fixed. Uh, if, the, if the user puts a note on the ticket or gives a call back saying, no, that wasn't fixed, then they can just go ahead and, and open up the ticket again. But if they don't, then it'll automatically close it for you. 
So um, I recommend naming these uh, basically whatever is happening on the scheduled item, just so that you don't have to click into it to see oops, exactly what is going on. Now I'm going to leave the category and category options blank because I want this to apply to every single ticket in the IT department. So the status that I'm going to select here would be resolved. You might call it something different. Uh, and on the elapsed time, I'm going to put this to two days. And of course, I want to do this from the modified date because it would have been modified when I set it to resolved. And what I want the scheduler to do here is change the status. And I want it to change the status to closed. So that's all I need to do. And I can click Save Changes. And now that will go ahead and run. Um, if you notice, it does the same thing that our templates do. And you can see that it's running by looking at these black dots going in a circle. If at any time you want to stop it, you can go ahead and click the Stop Process button, and then it will no longer run. So that's one example. Um, another one would be to send that initial email out, um, letting a, a user know their ticket has been submitted. Now, again, the category, I'm going to leave that blank because I want it to apply to everyone. And the statuses don't matter at this point either. Um, actually, if they're submitting it, you might want to select awaiting dispatch if they're submitting it by email the ticket because that's the status um, that all the tickets are in when they come in. Or work in progress if that's the status when they actually log into the program and submit a ticket. So most people will do this one minute after the created date. And then, of course, you're going to want to select send email. And then that opens up a whole bunch of things here at the bottom. So you're going to select who you want to send it to. Now, your technicians will automatically get a, an email when a, a ticket is submitted. So you probably don't want to do ticket assignee because then they will get two. Uh, but if you do ticket contact, this is just going to go out to whoever submitted the ticket. Um, you can, of course, blind copy or carbon copy somebody on that. Um, and then here you would type in the subject and the message that you want sent out. Now, there is an option here um, under the show tags. And I'm going to click that so that you can see this. Now, anytime that you copy one of these tags and put it into the subject or into the message of the email, it will take that information right from the ticket itself. So ticket ID is one uh, that you might want to put in here so that the ticket ID number is referenced. Um, and then you can go ahead and fill out the rest of the information uh, as far as, you know, if it's just a, a welcome message or thinks your ticket's been submitted, um, you don't even have to do the ticket ID. Uh, but just keep in mind when you do copy those and paste them into the body of the email, oops, then those will display whatever is in the ticket. Now, we do have some knowledge base articles on this out there. Um, and I will reference those knowledge base articles in the PDF that I send to you. Um, or you can just reference the PDF as well. So the last thing is frequency. Uh, if you just want that to go the one time, which most often you would in this case scenario, you just go ahead and click Save Changes. And now any time a ticket is submitted, they're going to receive that uh, email. Now, another one that you can do, um, just as a, a third example, is if there hasn't been anything done on the ticket for a few days and you want to maybe send a reminder to the, the technician, uh, you can do that. So we'll just call this one uh, three-day notification. Again, I'll leave the category blank so that it, belong, or so that it goes to every ticket. Um, if you do want to get specific, we do have some customers that if the category is um, the hardware and it's a server issue, then they want these emails to go out uh, if there's no change being made on the ticket. So it's just a constant reminder of, hey, the server is still having an issue. Um, you need to go in and address that. So you can get more specific and add categories or category options if you would like. Uh, so this particular one um, on the statuses, I can go ahead and select all of my open statuses, basically because they could be in any, any status. 
Now, the um, elapsed time, uh, because I said this was a three-day notification, I'm going to put three days. Now, you want to make sure you select from the modified date, because that would be the last time that anybody was in looking at the ticket or making a change on it. And then we'll go ahead and send the email. Now, this one, um, you'll want to to send it to the technician, so the assignee, that's who it's going to go to here. And then you can um, do the same thing with these tags. If you want, you know, you can copy the ticket number, uh, the subject of that ticket, uh, maybe even what the status is, and then go ahead and type in, you know, your note to the technician. So you can leave this set to one time. Um, I do know some customers that will repeat this every so often uh, until that created, or I'm sorry, until that modified date is changed, meaning that's the technician did go in and they did make a change there. And then you would go ahead and save that as well. Um, and then here all of them are that we just created. They are currently running. Um, and I'm just going to stop two of these because I didn't really put correct information in. Um, but that's how you can stop it too. So if you, if you don't want to send those out anymore, um, you don't have to, but they're saved here in the scheduler so that if you ever do want to turn them back on, you can. Now, there is one other thing that you can do. If you want to send um, these notifications or the scheduler notifications um, through a text message, when you're setting this up uh, in the two, or I'm sorry, in the CC field, you can go ahead, and I have this in the, the note here, but you would put in the phone number. I'm just going to put my number in here. And then um, you would go ahead and put in your carrier information. And like I said, I have those listed, but mine is T-Mobile. So I would write tmomail.net. And with that information in there, that's going to just send an SMS text message to my phone. Uh, most of us get emails on our phone now, so you might not need to do that. But if you'd rather receive it that way, um, you do have the option of putting that in here. Okay, so that's it for the scheduler. Um, if you ever have a scenario that maybe you want to try to create a scheduled item or you need something to happen and you're not sure if the scheduler can do it, um, you can go ahead and give us a call and we can step you through that process and see if it is something um, that the scheduler is capable of. So the next thing that we're going to go to here is the service level agreement setup. If you notice here on the lower left-hand side, you do have an option that says service level agreements. And the first thing you're going to want to do is set up your, your business hours because these are the times when uh, your technicians would be held to that SLA. So we do have two options here. There's a default 9 to 5 or a default 24-7 if that's what you're currently using. Um, if you're not using either one of those, uh, you can create your own. Uh, maybe you work for the government and you don't work Fridays anymore. You just have a Monday through Thursday schedule, or it could even be an every other Friday. So you can name that and then put the days that you are going to be working and the start time and the end time. So that's the first thing that you want to do is set your hours. The next thing you want to do is create the model. There is a default model here, which you, of course, can change the name of, so you could use this one if you wanted to. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and edit that. Now, in here, you're seeing the priorities, low, medium, and high, um, and what the response time and the resolution time is set to. So this is what you would create according to whatever your SLA is. So if a ticket comes in at a low priority and your SLA states that the response time should be in 16 hours with a resolution time of 40 hours, uh, you would go ahead and enter that. Now, these are set to different calendars, so I can go ahead and edit any of these, or when you are actually creating it, um, you would select that calendar that you selected here. I'm sorry, that you created here. Now, in order to attach an SLA to a group, once you have created, um, you might even have different SLAs for different groups, so you could create multiple ones. I'll just log into the support site until that time's out there. So what you would need to do is, is attach that SLA to a group. So you go into the group itself, and you can edit that. 
And there's an option here for the SLA model. So you would just click the down arrow and then you'll see that model that you created and you would select it here. So you can create multiple models uh, across multiple groups. Now in the support site, we do not have the SLA configured. If you notice when I click here, it's gonna tell me that because of my license file. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and attach that SLA. Now, once tickets come in, um, what you're gonna see here, now I just added this in, but uh, when you click on the SLA tab, you're always going to see the, the past three months. So this goes back uh, to April 22nd to today. And of course you can change these to see different information, but it'll always show you the last three months. And what it will show you are the different technicians that are listed. So in this uh, test database here, I just have the one IT technician and then the ticket pool. Um, and of course they, there's no tickets in for them since I've set up the SLA. So if you, uh, go back to your office today and you go ahead and set up the SLA for your technicians today, it's not going to show any information um, for tickets that have been entered up until after that is set up. So what you'll see here is, is um, the tickets that the technician has and if they are currently in um, the SLA time frame, those will appear green. And if you hover over it, you'll see how many tickets. And you can even click on it, and it will show you the list of tickets. Uh, if they have breached the SLA, then it will be red. And you can hover over that to see how many tickets are in the breached area. And you can also click on that to see which tickets the SLA was breached on. Now, technicians will be able to see um, if they are within the SLA when they're working a ticket. It will appear at the top and it will tell them if it's being met or if it has been breached. So they will have uh, those updates as they're working their tickets. Okay, uh, so importing assets. We're going to move over to that. Now the asset tracker, uh, if you notice, I don't have anything listed here yet because I wanted to show you how to do the, the import from a CSV file. Uh, but if you log into your help desk and you don't see the assets tab, you need to just add that to, to that group. So let me show you that first. You just go back to the same groups area, edit that group, and then there is an option right here asking you, you know, which asset tracker do you want to use. It might be set to none, and that's why you're not seeing the asset tab. So you just need to make sure you select the internal asset tracker. And then um, if you log out, log back in, then you'll see this assets tab. So I'm going to go ahead and click on import and select the file. Now one of my, the recommendations that I would make is to make sure that your file matches up with um, the fields in the help desk. It just goes quicker that way. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, so it's asking, you know, what kind of type or what kind of file types. I'm going to select Excel, CSV. And is the first line of row labels? Uh, yes, in mine it is. Um, so now I'm just going to click load file. So what you're going to see is it's asking me, well, how do you want to match these up? So this is what I have in the actual file. And then this are, these are the fields when I click the down arrow of what is in the help desk. So asset number, I'm going to select asset number. That's where I want that to go. Name. And again, I matched these up so that they would be the same. Um, this is kind of where it comes in handy. If they aren't the same, you would just need to say, you know, match up where you want it to go here. Okay, once that's done, I can just go ahead and click import. And this tells me that it was successful. So to see what I've imported, I can click on list assets. And I just put two in an Excel file to show you this. But so it did go ahead and import those two. But let me show you all of the information that you can add. So you might have a CSV file that just has basic information. And once you get most of your assets or all of your assets in, then you can come in here and make changes. So the only things, there's only four items that are required when you add an asset, and that's the number, the name, the type, and the status. 
So prior to loading anything, I did come in and I added asset types and asset statuses. Um, the other things that you can add, uh, you can see on the screen there's a lot of information that you can add, but one, one thing um, I need you to know here is if it does say EHD after it, that means it's pulling it from the help desk. So if you notice, I have an asset location here that I added of which office this is in, but the location EHD, this is actually the location in the system. Um, so if you are a school district um, and maybe your locations are different schools, that's what it would be here. So you can see that's how I have this one set up. So that's the difference between um, one that does not have EHD after it and one that does. So if you notice, these are all my categories in this group and category options. Uh, so the next tab over, the accounting information, uh, you can add in PO numbers, um, the maintenance costs, the warranty dates. Um, under the network tab, uh, this is where it would show uh, maybe you do have a, a network scanning device and that's how you imported the information. If it did pull the MAC address and the operating system version, it would display here or you can come in here and add it. Uh, under associated tickets, this of course isn't going to show anything because I just imported them. But as your technicians receive tickets and they want to attach an asset to that ticket, they do so right on the ticket itself. And then you can come into the asset piece and you can view any associated tickets with the, that particular asset that you're viewing. Now software licenses, uh, I can come in and add whichever software licenses um, are on this machine. There might not be any, uh, but you can add those here. Now under the remote management, um, if you want to go ahead and remote into that machine, um, once the asset is attached to the ticket and this is configured for that asset, you will have a little computer that will appear and that's how the technician would then remote into that machine. And then the asset audit is just like the ticket audit where any changes that are made to that asset uh, will display here with um, the dates, the times, and who did it. Okay, so that's just a, a real quick import. Um, of course, you can always add one at a time if you would like. There's an add asset over here on the right-hand side, and I can click that and then add that information um, that I need here. Um, now, just to show you, when I created the asset types, it's very simple. It's just like creating a location. You just click on new, type in the name, and then it will appear as an asset type. Uh, same with statuses. I just have active and inactive here, um, but you can go ahead and add whatever your statuses may be. And then um, there are options here, just like on the ticket, how you can attach custom fields or put custom fields on the, on the ticket itself. You can have custom fields in the asset too, meaning if you want to track some sort of information that we don't have as a field for the assets, you can add that. Uh, for example, I have a customer that tr they track their transportation fleet um, through the asset tracker. So a custom field that they created was the date of the last oil change and what the VIN number of that particular bus or car is. Um, so those are things that you can add. The field groups would be um, the tab across the top. Um, so I don't have any in here, but um, it would be added right here at the end. Um, so whatever you named it, you could name it custom fields or transportation, you know, whatever it may be. And then the custom fields is where you're going to add um, what you actually want to store in the system. So you can add much more information than just the default um, fields that we have listed here. Now, you can run a filter on your assets uh, just keep in mind that when you're looking at assets and you're running reports or creating filters or doing anything with them, it's all going to be listed here on the left-hand side. Uh, so if you click up here to filters, that's going to be your filters for tickets. But if you click filters here, uh, you'll notice the screen looks the same, but I can go ahead and create one. I don't know if that's blocking. Oh. And then here we are. I can uh, name the filter or if I just want to look at something real quick. Um, here you can see it's showing the asset fields instead of the ticket fields. Uh, but 
it's, it's basically the same concept. And then over here on the right-hand side, you can, of course, order the information how you want. You can store vendor information in here as well. Um, you can import the vendors the same way that you did the assets, or you can just add one at a time. Um, you're basically just adding that vendor information, phone number, email. Uh, your software licenses, if you do want to attach those licenses to assets, you'll need to add those licenses here. And then um, you can go ahead and attach them to assets. And we went over the import option. And then, of course, any reports that you would like to run, um, go ahead and you can, of course, export a filter and then create a report within Excel uh, if, if something that you want is not listed here. But the asset has banked reports. So I can just come in and see all of my assets by owner, uh, by the group, the type, and then I can run these expiration reports or the purchase report. So all of that information is available to you under the Assets tab. Okay, so um, that is it for the webinar, but I am going to go ahead and see if there's any questions here. Looks like there is, so let me just take a look at these. So Dan, um, it looks like there's two questions here. Um, the first one, I think you can see them, Dan. Can you see those? Do you want to go ahead and answer those? Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> there is a, the, we recently put in, um, at, I don't know if I have control here, uh, Catherine, do I? Let me see. Uh, no, but I can switch I just, it. I just need control so I can show them the um, LDAP. Uh, hold on. Okay, so um, we recently added um, a synchronization, configure LDAP synchronization. Um, however, uh, this currently isn't working. Uh, I think it's being um, worked on by our development team. Um, this works off of um, the Cron, uh, Cron Maker. So you would just go to their website to um, input an execution pattern. Basically, you know, it's a, it's a polling interview, um, interval to retrieve data from your, um, from your LDAP. So you set, how, you know, how often you want that to go out and sync with your, with your LDAP. But again, um, there is a, there is a, a, a ticket open with our development team, um, to get this up and working, but this, this is fairly new. Um, so it's, it's currently, yeah, it's currently not working, but that's one, this is, uh, this is set so that they can, yeah, go out and, and sync your LDAP based on, you know, the pattern that you set there. What, what, is there any other questions? I don't know. It looks like there's one right below that one. To automate a response to multiple tickets within the same issue? Um, I'm only seeing one. Is there any way to pull in Active Directory machines into assets? I don't believe there is with with LDAP. I don't think that's an option. Actually, and that's a good question. I mean, that's a good enhancement, actually, because I don't think that that's possible with it. I don't know if you can export your, you know, export your your assets from from LDAP and and then and then just import them the way Catherine mentioned. Um, but currently, yeah, there's no way to go in and import them from LDAP. Okay, yeah, and that's something that, you know, we can submit as an enhancement request as well so that we can just add that into it rather than, you know, having to export it. But if you can do that and import it, that would be a way to get those in there right now. Um, so the next question that it says, is there a way to automate a response to multiple tickets with the same issue? Um, the way that you can do that is if the category is the same. So if people are submitting tickets and they're selecting the same category, then you can schedule responses to go according to, those, to that category. Um, but right now, it, that would be the only way. Uh, it's not going to look at the body of the ticket and then go ahead and send um, automated responses that way. Okay, and then another question. Is there any way to associate an asset with a particular user as to have the asset associated with the ticket upon a particular user's submission? Um, you can add the user in the asset piece, um, and then when they submit a ticket, the technician would still have to add that asset to them. 
um, but it's it's as simple as when they click on the little computer to add it, they can just type the person's name in and then it will pull up any uh, assets attached to that person. So basically when you're looking at the assets here, um, you could add that user's name under the EHD owner. And then when your technician is viewing the ticket and they want to see you know, all, all assets that are attached to that user, they would just um, click to attach the asset and then do a search by that owner and then they would all appear. So it doesn't do it automatically, but if you are putting the owner's names in there, then the technician would easily see you know, who belongs to what. Let me just see if there's any other questions. Okay, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, but if what we've went over today sparks questions for you, you can always send Dan or I an email. Um, and like I said, we are recording this and all of the webinars are on the website. Uh, so you can see those. Um, and also, I'll go ahead and send out the link to the recording as well as the PDF to all of those that signed up for the webinar today. Uh, and then if you have any ideas for our next month's webinar or something that you want to go over or that you want more detail on, you can go ahead and send those to me as well. Um, we try to get customer input and have those be the topics of our webinar because then we know that that's the information that you're looking to get. So. Um, don't hesitate to send that over to me as well. So I want to thank everybody for attending, um, and we will see you next month.